I've been canning up a storm today, but I've took a little break and I'm going to read to you for a little while because it's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Chapter 12, Living Off the Land. We didn't have much to eat, but it was pure. If the reader can imagine living in an area four or five hundred miles from a town in which only a few staples were available, and if he can imagine having little or no money with which to purchase these staples, then he will begin to understand how it was on Newman's Ridge when Alex was a child. It was only 20 miles to the stores in Jonesville, Virginia, but it took most of a day to walk there, and about the same amount of time it would take today's family to drive from Bristol, Tennessee to New York City. The distance from a trading center and the almost total lack of cash resulted in the people of that area developing a self-sufficiency which was perhaps unsurpassed anywhere in America. Not only were these people able to find or raise all their food, they learned how to make sugar, salt, vinegar, all sorts of teas and other pseudo-luxury items such as soda, yeast, soda pop, chewing gum, and even a sort of coffee. The forest may appear unproductive and unyielding to those not familiar with its many secrets, but to a knowledgeable and perceptive native, it yields a rich and varied bounty. One of the more important foods produced in the wild was honey. The honey bee is thought to have been brought to America in the early 1600s by the English. The settlers took colonies of bees with them as they moved west, and swarms escaped, returning to the wilderness habitat from whence they were first captured thousands of years before. I knew that Alex had for many years kept a number of beehives. I asked him about his experience with wild bees. Alex, when I was a boy, there was an old man in our community who spent most of his time roaming the mountains, hunting, fishing, and looking for bee trees. Did you ever hunt bee trees? I don't guess there's a feller in the country that's found more bee trees than I have. I got out one fall and searched up and down this ridge for miles around, and I found 21 bee trees. I marked them and went back in the spring to get them, and when I went back, there was only one stand of bees left. What happened? Did someone beat you to them? Something, not someone. When they got cold and froze up during the winter, the squirrels got in there and tore up their nest and eat that honey. Killed them out. They would have got the other swarm, except it was in a hole so small that they couldn't get their heads in. I take it that most of those bee trees were on other people's land? Oh yeah, but once I found a bee tree and marked it, no matter whose land it was on, the bees belonged to me. If the owner of the land where the tree stood got the bees, then you could law him, sue him. You sure could. I've noted of that happening. Now, you couldn't cut the other man's tree unless he agreed to it. If he didn't give you permission to cut the tree, then you'd have to climb up and get the bees out or leave them alone. I found a big white oak back here on the ridge that was just a swarming with bees. It was on Elvin Fleenor's place, and I asked him, could I cut the tree and get that honey? Told him I'd divide it with him. But he wouldn't agree to let me cut it. He thought he'd wait a while and get the honey himself. I just come off and said no more to him. The next day, I got a feller to go up there to where the tree stood. I took me a rope, a bucket, and a hatchet. I stood there and studied the situation a few minutes, and I finally said to myself, You're mine. About 30 feet up that white oak, right close to where the bees were going in and out of the hole, there was a big limb. This limb come right over and nearly touched a big beech tree. I climbed up that beach and took me two long poles, made me a sort of a bridge from the beach over to that white oak limb. I tied them poles to where they wouldn't roll or scoot. I took the hatchet and cut into that hollow white oak and raked all the trash out and got about two and a half gallons of the prettiest honey you ever saw. I let it down a little at a time in a bucket to the ground, and that feller on the ground poured it in a lard can. I told Elvin about that, and it liked to have killed him. He said I sure had the nerve to climb up there in the top of that tree and risk falling out. Said he wouldn't have done that for the best farm on the ridge. 
He asked me how many stings I got, and I said I didn't get one. I smoked them out of that tree before I ever started chopping. How do you go about finding a tree? If you go to where there's water in the woods, you'll nearly always find bees there. When they're raising their young, they're all the time packing water to them youngins. When they get all the water they can carry, they'll go up high and then head for the tree. Is it true that the bee will make a straight bee line for its home? I've heard people say that they'd always go as straight toward the bee tree as you could shoot a bullet. But that's a mistake. I followed them where they would go up a hollow and cut around on the other side of a hill. I'm sure you couldn't keep your eyes on a bee for a mile or two while running through the woods following him. What would you do when you lost sight of him? Just stand there and watch, and directly you'll see another one headed in the same direction. You'd follow him just as long as you could see him and then wait for another one. Just keep doing that till you found the tree. I've heard of people putting out various types of concoctions to attract wild bees so they can follow them to their trees. They call that baiting, I think. Do you ever do that? Yeah, I've used bait to attract bees. I'd get some tansy leaves and crumble them up in a little honey and set it out in a pan or a bucket. If it was a warm day, the bees would smell that tansy and be there in no time. I don't care where you set that, they'd sure smell it. They'd fill up on that honey and head toward their tree. And all you had to do was follow them. You've kept bees all of your life, haven't you? Oh yeah, I've had over 30 stands when I lived up there on the ridge. I've still got 16 or 17 stands out there in the yard now. I let Ricky have them to tend on the hives. He got a good lot of honey this year. Did you ever buy a stand of bees? I never bought a stand, and I never sold a stand. I captured them from the woods, started doing that a long time before I got married. After I found a bee tree and cut it, I'd take a cross cut and saw into it where I could get at them. You'd have to use a smoker when you started tearing into their nest. You've got to get that queen. She's a big, long thing and looks just like a big yellow wasp. Just exactly. You get her and put her in a box, and the rest of them will follow her, just like a gang of pigs will follow an old sow. I suppose you captured a lot of bees when they swarmed. Oh, yeah. Nearly every spring, if you'd be on the watch, you'd find a swarm or two of bees. I'd find a swarm and get me a gum, a hive made from a hollow black gum tree, to put them in and rake them by, up by the handful. They'd swarm around my face till I couldn't see for them. Never would sting me. They're not bad to sting when they're swarming. What time of the year do bees swarm? Oh, they start about the 1st of April and on up till June, sometimes later. But the earlier you get them, the better off you are. A bee swarm in May is worth a stack of hay. One in June is worth a silver spoon. And one in July is worth a blue tail fly. That's just about right, too. If you get them in April and May when the apple trees are blooming, you won't have no trouble. If you get a swarm after June, they don't have time to make enough calm to keep them through the winter. There's not too much blooming after that. Oh, of course, you could feed them along, and that would help. Every hive had to have a queen? Oh, yes. If you don't have a queen, you don't have nothing. They'll just fly off in all directions. There was a preacher who lived down here on the lower end of Panther Creek by the name of Jim Brooks. He had a big gum of bees, and it come a rain and just about flooded them out. The gum was so full of mud that the bees could barely get in and out. He come up here to get me to help him move them. I made him a new gum and went down there. I pried one side of the old gum and was just scraping them bees up with my hands, putting them in the new gum. He had a boy helping me, and he seen the queen. He said, look at that old wasp, and before I could stop him, he grabbed her and killed her. I said, wasp the devil, you've killed the queen. Alex laughed heartily. I thought his daddy was going to kill that boy, just grabbed her and mashed her to death. Called her a damned old wasp. I said, you just as well take the bees and throw them in the creek. They're not worth a nickel without their queen.
I suppose honey was a very important food when you were growing up and while you were raising your family. It would have been hard to have got along without honey. Most of the time, it was the only sweetening we had. You could make your breakfast on a piece or two of bread and a little honey. Five or six gums is all the bees you needed to make enough honey for a family. I used to keep a lot more than that when I sold honey. Got to where you could get $2 a gallon for it. Then they started requiring you to have them inspected and pay a tax if you sold honey. So I just quit. I've just keep enough for my own use. You've got to tend to bees or they'll soon die out. I've fooled with bees since I was 12 or 13 years old. I wouldn't give a man a dime to sit down and write me a book about bees. I could write one myself. I've sat and watched them and studied them for hours at a time. Alex launched into a long discourse on the characteristics of the workers, the drones, and the queens and their relationship to one another. He told about the drones, which he called old roosters, and how they did no work, whatever, staying in the hive, fertilizing the queen, and eating up what the little workers brought in. He pointed out that these drones often become too numerous, especially in the fall of the year, and that the workers would get rid of most of them. They would carry them outside the hive, he said, and either sting them to death or cut their wings off so they could not return to the hive. A few hours later, as Mutt and I walked down toward the sawmill, we noticed an unusual amount of activity on the little platform in front of one of Alex's beehives. On closer observation, we found the worker bees carrying the drones out into the cold November air. The drones seemed addled and dazed and weren't even resisting the ostracism imposed upon them. The energetic little workers took them to the edge of the platform and rolled them off where they were left to die. We watched for a moment, and then Mutt said, Pap sure knowed what he's talking about. On another occasion, Alex was talking about how important the honeybee was to the mountain folk. He had finished his discourse, and I couldn't think of anything else to ask him for a moment. Solely for the purpose of breaking the unaccustomed silence, I asked what I thought to be a rather foolish question, but the question was better than I thought it to be because it prompted a most interesting and informative answer. Alex, was honey from yellow jackets and bumblebees any good? The yellow jackets, honey, ain't no count. But they ain't no better honey than bumblebee honey. They store it in little cups about the size of a big thimble. Sometimes you can get 15 or 20 of them cups from one nest. Along about the last of May is the best time to get bumblebee honey. You've got to get it before the young ones get up any size, for they'll eat it up faster than the old ones can pack it in. You've got to be awful careful when you're robbing a bumblebee's nest. If you ever get them stirred up, then you're in trouble, sure enough. Did you ever get honey from the locust tree? The locust tree produced a pod about a foot long. Now when that pod got right plump and quit growing, you knowed it was full of honey. You could gather them in the late summer on up into the fall and they'd keep pretty good. You could take one of them pods and take two boards and squeeze it and the honey would run out. It's not as good as bee honey, but you can eat it or use it to sweeten with either one. The blight come and killed about all the locust trees out, and now you hardly ever see one. You've often told me that some of the families on Newman's Ridge practically lived out of the woods. What was some of the other things the forest produced? Back then, there was a little tree, a bush, they called a sarvis tree. They had berries that was good to eat if you got them when they was green. They're about the size of a huckleberry. I've gone to a sarvis tree many a time and picked a half gallon. They're no good to make a pie with, too bitter. But if you get them at the right time, you never eat a better berry than a sarvis. They're just about all gone now. You never see a sarvis tree no more. Did you ever eat any black hawls? They used to be a side of them. And if you got them right after the first frost, they's good. You could eat all them you wanted and they wouldn't hurt you. A hackberry is pretty good too, but there's not much flesh on him, just mostly a big seed and a skin. I used to go out with my grandfather to hunt wild hazelnuts. Did you have them here? Hazelnuts? Yeah, we'd gather them. We'd get walnuts, hickory nuts, chinkapins, and chinky pin acorns. 
A chinky pan tree don't get very big. I never did see one grow higher than the door. They have a burr like a chestnut. The chinky pin oak had an acorn that looked a heap like a chinky pin. That's why they called it a chinky pin oak. That's about the only kind of acorn you can eat. The rest of them are too bitter. Before the blight killed the chestnut trees, why the woods was just full of chestnuts. A lot of families lived on chestnuts in the fall of the year and half the winter. I understand people used to let their hogs run wild and fatten on acorns in the fall. A hog will do pretty well on black oak and chestnut oak acorns when they first fall, but they won't eat most acorns until after a good freeze. They don't taste so bitter after they freeze. They used to be just acres of May apples that growed in the woods. You know what a May apple is, don't you? It grows up about a foot or so high and has fruit on it that gets about the size of a peach. They smell good and taste good too when they're ripe. There was several kinds of edible berries, I suppose. There was all kinds of huckleberries in the mountains, wild raspberries, blackberries, and dewberries. Dewberries grow flat on the ground on a vine. I've picked many a gallon of dewberries. They've got the best flavor of any berry you ever eat when they're good and ripe. They make the best jelly. I could eat a glass full of them any time. What about pawpaws? People used to might near live off pawpaws. I saw Jim Maxey sit down once with his hat full of pawpaws and eat the last one of them. Pawpaws that grow on a tree out in the field, out in the open, won't last long after they fall off. The insects and things will soon eat them up. But if you find a pawpaw patch in the woods where the leaves cover them, they'll keep a long time. I was out hunting one day and I hadn't had anything to eat. It was in the winter time. I smelled pawpaws and I got to scratching under the leaves and the ground was just covered with them. I sat down and ate the biggest bait you ever saw. There were several kinds of wild grapes. There was a lot of different kinds of grapes that was good to eat. Fox grapes, possum grapes, pink grapes, summer grapes, and muscadines. The muscadines were the biggest grape there was. You could smell a big vine of muscadines a half a mile might near it, and that's the best way to find them. Oh, they're good. The possum grape was small, about the size of a number three shot, and they wasn't much to them. The pink grape was sour, but it made awful good brandy. Law at the brandy I've made from them pink grapes. In his discussion of wild food, Alex mentioned artichokes. The plant he described was the Jerusalem artichoke, which produces a rough tuber somewhat like the potato. I've raised them in gardens, but never knew they grew wild. A little research revealed that they are one of the very few plants which will grow either in the wild or as a cultivated plant. Another interesting aspect of Alex's comments on artichokes was his mention that they could be smelled out by pigs. This is reminiscent of the great European delicacy, the truffle, which grows mainly in France and which is dug with the assistance of pigs. The claim is made that the pig can smell a truffle from a distance of 20 feet, even when it is buried deep in the ground. The pig is allowed to root it out, but the valuable fungus is quickly taken from him for use in the finest restaurants. A recent article on the subject indicated that the current price for truffles is $500 per pound. Naturally, I was surprised when Alex described how a Tennessee hog could smell an artichoke in much the same manner as a French pig could sniff out a truffle. Up here where Pap lived, on the back side of the place, there were two or three acres that was pretty flat, and artichokes would grow there as thick as if they had been planted. They produced a sort of tater that grows sometimes two feet deep. People would come there and bring sacks and baskets and dig them artichokes. They eat pretty good. Now a hog could find them when a man couldn't. I've seen a hog root so deep that they might near had to stand on their head. Oh, they knowed exactly where to root, and you could tell by the way he was rooting when he was going after one. I reckon Mother Nature must have given him a powerful sense of smell. The last time I was up here, you were telling me about a kind of mushroom Kyle and Dora Bolin brought you, which you liked so much. It's called a wild fish, I think. Law at the wild fish in the woods this spring. 
They grow to be about the size of your arm, and the end is right blunt, just like you broke it off. They come out early in the spring, just about the time trees start putting out their leaves. When they get to turn in a sort of gray color, you need to get them. They don't last long. They have a little bitty bug on them, and them bugs will destroy them. After you gather them, you can take and put them in water, and them bugs will every one float off. How do you cook them? You just split them in the open, split them open, and fry them like you was frying a potato. It'll just take a few minutes. They taste just like fish, only better. I'd like to have a mess of wild fish today. Because of Alex's truly astounding knowledge of old-timey things, I often forgot that he had kept up with modern-day contrivances and methods as well. His comments on the mushroom he called wild fish and whether or not they could be frozen is illustrative. Dory and Kyle gathered a great deal of wild fish this spring and put them in the deep freeze. I told Dory that they wouldn't keep too long that way. If you eat them right away, they do pretty well, but it don't take long before they're ruined. They won't keep in the freezer like a lot of other food. I'm afraid she'll lose them. Dora Bolin proofread this manuscript, and after this paragraph about freezing wild fish, she penciled in the following, how right he was, I had to throw away several bags. Did garlic grow wild too? People would go far and near looking for garlic and ramps. They'd put a little salt on them and a piece of bread, if they had it, and eat them raw. They'd eat the blade and the heads too. If you eat ramps and garlic, you'll never be bothered with worms, but they'll smell you all day. On my way to see Alex one morning in early spring, I saw an old bonneted woman out in the middle of what appeared to be a barren field. She carried a basket in the crook of her arm, and her eyes searched the ground from one side to the other as she trudged along. Occasionally, she stooped to pick the tips of some tiny plant which had barely made its way from the yet cold soil. Anyone who knew anything about rural southern Appalachia would have known that this old matriarch was looking for salad. And likewise, a person with even a cursory knowledge with the folkways of our region would have known that salad is always cooked instead of eaten raw. The little crest that peeps unnoticed from beneath a blade of dry corn fodder, the dock that grew on the south side of the haystack, and the hardy dandelion were all candidates for the salad pot. But one had to know which plants were edible, at what stage in their growth to gather them, and what other plants to mix them with. The stooped old lady reminded me of the hundreds of kindly old souls whom I'd known who looked forward to picking the first salad in the spring. It was for many the first time they had walked the fields and forests since the gloomy, dismal days of winter had begun, and the greens tasted good after so long without fresh vegetables. The daughters-in-law would inquire as to what all was included in the brew, the men would ask for more, and the old women who picked and cooked the salad would be happy. I knew that Alex would be able to tell me about salad greens which grew wild in the meadows and mountains of Hancock County. What were some of the greens people would pick for salads in the early spring? We'd go to the woods and fields and hunt different things. We'd get lamb's quarters. Oh, what a sight to see people picking lamb's quarters. That's the best stuff you ever had. Woolen breeches is pretty good, too. We'd get what they called shoney. It grows in big round bunches the size of a plate and looks like mustard, only the leaves ain't as big. You cut it off and the milk would just run out of it. It takes Northland to grow shoney. Doc is all right if you get it while it's young, but if you let it get to be a right smart size, it's no good. There's three different kinds of doc, yellow doc, narrow doc, and burdock. Burdock isn't good for a salad, but the others is about as good as mustard. You take plantain and mix it with narrow dock, about half and half, and that's the best salad I ever eat. Might near it. I don't like too much dandelion in a salad, because it makes it bitter. Hydrangea, when it first comes out, before the leaves grow on it, it's good. We pick kitty, too. Oh, that kitty is a good salad. Did you ever hear of cropped cabbage salad? It is better than regular cabbage. Before your cabbage heads out, you could 
cut off the bottom leaves and cook them by themselves for a salad. Or you could mix them with other grains. Put you a big piece of meat in it if you had it and cook that down good. It wouldn't hurt your cabbage at all about heading out to pull off them bottom leaves. They'd finally go to waste anyhow. Poke came on later in the spring. It would be out big enough to pick between the 1st and the 10th of April, and you'd hardly ever see a poke stalk but what somebody had broke out the top for salad. You got to get it when it was young and tender. You use the leaves for a salad, but you can take and fry the stalks, slice them up like you would okra, roll it in meal, and you've got something that's worth eating. Margie used to can poke stalks and poke salad too. Poke salad, if it's got at the right time, is the best salad I ever eat. Do you like dry land cresses? No, they're too bitter. I used to eat water cresses, but I never cared too much for them either. Now, they was what they call a branch lettuce that growed in the branches in early spring that was pretty good. You could cook it in a salad, or you could kill it with hot grease like you do tame lettuce. Did you ever eat any sheep sorrel? Sheep sorrel is awful sour, and it's good to put in your sweet apples when you're cooking them. A sweet apple has got a sickening taste when it's cooked, and they're no account for a pie. But if you take and put some of that sheep sorrel in, and it sure brings out the taste. You can make a pie out of nothing but sheep sorrel if you sweeten it pretty good. It tastes just like an early apple pie. Before we leave the foods you got from the fields and forests, tell me about making sugar. There was a big stand of sugar maple trees that stood up on Grandpap's place, and we'd tap them every year. Pap and Grandpap would generally tap them in February and March and let them run in big wooden troughs. It was my job to pack the sap from these troughs to where we had two big iron kettles to boil it in. Lord, I'd go in a trot all day long, carrying that sap water over them hills and rocks, trying to keep them troughs from running over. I've got so tired that I wished I'd never see another sugar tree. I would have druther seen my coffin a-coming, might near it, than to have seen another bucket of that sap. I'd help them boil it off, too. I was fixing up the fire around the kettles one day, and I was wearing an old cotton shirt that Mama had made for me, and it catched fire. It burned way up past my elbow and liked to have killed me. They was great blisters that come up, and after the sun went down, Mama took a needle and opened them blisters up, and they's a half a pint of water that come out of there. She put a poultice on it, and soon it got well, but the scars stayed with me for 40 years. How many gallons of sap does it take to make a pound of sugar? A bushel of sap will make about a pound of sugar, or it'll make a quart of molasses, or three pints of syrup. What's the difference between maple molasses and maple syrup? Tree molasses, or maple molasses, is just a little thicker than tree syrup, that's all. You just let them boil a little longer. A large kettle that held two bushel would only make two pounds of sugar, you say. How long would it take to boil down a kettle full? Oh, it would take about all day long. I know that this was your main source of sweetening, but did you have extra sugar to sell? Oh, yeah. That was about the only money we had coming in all winter. I remember one time there's an old feller by the name of Clum Testerman who come to our house to buy some sugar. Mama had a two-gallon brass kettle plumb full of that sugar, and she turned it upside down, and it dropped out into a big solid cake. Old Man Testerman said, I'll swear, ain't that pretty? He gave her 10 cents a pound for it. Some people would put a little cane molasses in the sugar to make it pay off better, but it wasn't as good. Pap never would allow us to do that, said it wasn't right. 10 cents a pound amounts to only 20 cents for the day's labor in boiling it down, not to mention carrying the sap to the kettle and the other work involved. Well, you wouldn't get rich at it, but every little bit helped out. Most people, even in our own region, assume that cane molasses was made here since the earliest pioneer times, but you tell me that this practice came on later. People didn't make cane molasses because they didn't have mills to grind it on. 
The first cane mill ever I saw was the one Grandpap Stewart made. He made it every bit out of wood, rollers, cogs, and all. The rollers had some play in them, and the first time you run your cane stalk through it, it would just bust it, and you couldn't get much juice. He'd have a man sitting on the other side to hand them stalks back to be run through the mill again. We'd take two or three of them and twist them together and run them through the second time, and that way we'd get most of the juice. We pulled the mill with an old bull, and people would come from miles around to watch us make molasses. A few years later, Jesse Maxey bought a mill with steel rollers, and it wasn't long before a lot of people started raising cane patches and making molasses. They'd eat it with bread, and they'd use it to bake pies and cakes. It got to where people would might near live off of molasses. Another great look into the life of Alex Stewart and into the food ways of that day. The chapter starts off that wonderful talk about the bees, um, so interesting. I've always wanted bees. I always wish I could have bees, but I've never had them. had an opportunity to have any hives. Pap told me about my Papaw Wade uh, following the bees back to their tree the way Alex did. They called it coursing the bees. So they would course the bees. They would follow them. Uh, so I found that part really interesting. But probably the most interesting part of that little section was that yellow jackets and, honey, and uh, bumblebee honey, who knew, you know? I've just never thought about it. But that was really, really interesting and interesting that Alex knew about it. That's another piece of knowledge that's probably been lost, but especially because of the, today, you know, living in the land of plenty, we don't have to worry about it. I, I buy local honey from a man who has hives, but... Even if you didn't, you could just go to the grocery store and buy honey. So, But in those days when Alex, kind of how John Rice starts out that chapter, talking about how they had to figure out how to feed themselves, or they'd starve. They had to. So if you were hungry and you were low on honey, it only makes sense that you'd try to find out if yellow jackets or bumblebees had honey. An interesting part of that uh, about the bees, too, that I found really interesting, since I'm always, you know, interested in language, is that he called the wasp, he said wasp. He didn't say wasper like I would say. I thought that was interesting that he used the word wasp instead of wasper. Another thing I thought was interesting, uh, kind of a difference in word usage, if you remember the, I don't remember if it's the last part we read or maybe the reading before that, but where Alex said there was one thing for sure, that herbs were called different things by different people. Well, I was reminded of that when he describes the service berry, service berry, we would say, service berry is really what it is. But so the service berries here, they're still plentiful here. The problem with them is they grow in the tip tops of trees, so they're hard to get, but they're not ripe like he described them being green, when they're ripe is when they're red for a sarvis, what I call a sarvis tree, sarvis berry, and they're very sweet, very sweet. So that makes me think that Alex was talking about something else. He wasn't talking about um, what I'm familiar with as being a sarvis tree. But then I go back to that part, that one chapter where he said that was for sure certain is that people called herbs by different things. And that was when John, Weiss, John Rice was questioning him about a different thing. I loved all the talk about the different uh, wild food items. The chinky pins, I especially like that. Um, I have seen chinky pins before, but they're r very rare now. Um, and I, I always loved that because people when I was little, because I have very dark eyes, lots of people when I was a small girl would tell me I had chinky pin eyes. So, and that's something you don't hear anymore today, but they would tell me that I had chinky pin eyes because my eyes are almost black. Um, I enjoyed all those different, all the grapes and the berries and all those things that he talked about. We have fox grapes that grow wild by the creek. We have those. We have possum grapes that grow uh, not by the creek, but I actually had some in my yard and some back here. They're very tart though. They're really small, like he said, like I think he said like a number three shot. Very small, but very, very tart. And the pawpaws, pawpaws, pawpaws that he mentioned, they do not grow in my area of Appalachia. I wish they did. Now, there's a few people that have them growing in their yards where they've planted them, but um, I think that's more of like closer to Kentucky and in the area where Alex was, obviously, too, in Hancock County, Tennessee. But pawpaws don't, are not really found in western North Carolina that I know of, at least not in Cherokee County. I wish they were, though. I have eaten them, and I really liked them. I enjoyed the part that Alex talked about, uh, about them being really 
kind of, he was talking about how the bugs get on them, but they're not shelf stable, and that's why you don't often find them for sale in like in a grocery store or something. But it was interesting how he said that if they were covered by leaves, they stayed, they stayed uh, edible longer. They didn't just deteriorate. The wild fish that he talks about, the mushroom, I wonder if that was morel, although the way he describes it doesn't really sound like it because they're generally smaller, not the size of your arm. So I found that was that was really interesting. But people here would call those, the morels, uh, dry land fish, again, because they similar, I guess, in taste, at least the one that Alex is talking about. So I felt that was really interesting. Maybe you know more about that. If you do, please, please leave a comment and share it. And then kind of the ending where he was talking about how they made their sugar. Um, so he was talking about tapping the maple trees. That's something I've never done or know anybody in my area that does that. Uh, as far as this molasses, what he's calling molasses, here most people make sorghum. They use sorghum cane to make molasses. We just call it syrup. A lot of people call it sorghum syrup, but there's lots of people that call it molasses too. It's another thing, like Alex was saying, people call things different. Uh, it depending on where you live and how you was raised. So we just grew up calling it syrup. It was made from sorghum cane, people that grow sorghum here. But other people do call it molasses or sorghum syrup. So just another fascinating look into Alex's life. But also I really liked this part because it was about the food waste, so many different options and what they did with the honey and um, and the locust honey and then all the berries and all that. Just fascinating how they found out how many of those food waste come directly from the land. Again, it's because they had to had to depend on that to survive, to, uh, to not starve to death. So very interesting. We've got really far away from that now, of course, because we live in the land of plenty. We don't have to worry about those things. But I wish I had more knowledge about it. I wish I uh, could have went around with Alex to some of those places and learned from him. That would have been really nice. So please leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you from this part of the book, what you enjoyed. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday because we've got to see what happens next to Alex Stewart.